Thanks, everybody. It's great to see everyone. Um, I'm joking. We were just talking about how many Zoom sessions we've probably all been on um, over the last uh, couple months. I was joking with Anna before we started. I, I've run out of all my comedic material, so I'm not going to be remotely funny today. I won't even give an intro on myself because I, I got to come up with something new. I, I got to like figure out what to add. But it, in any event, um, I wanted to spice it up today. And I'm having uh, my partner that you all probably know very well, Michael Feldman, on with us as well. So I, I really what I wanted to accomplish was going kind of analyzing how, we're, how our negotiations on new development deals have changed um, in light of what's going on. And more so, I want to hear how you're currently negotiating deals that are not yet in contract and kind of, you know, compare notes in terms of, you know, what concessions we're seeing in our transactions, given the fact that, you know, obviously a large part of the incentive um, for developers to make sure that certainly you know, most concessions are not in recordable form and structure the transactions accordingly. So um, really want to compare notes, talk about this, keep it more of an extremely fluid conversation. Um, we have a you know small audience today, so it'd be great to have this more of an open dialogue um, rather than just us talking. Now, what are we, we uh, exactly five weeks into the beginning of phase two when real estate opened? And especially in the last two weeks, Michael and I have seen the market pick up uh, tremendously um, from our end. It's definitely been um, a large uptick in, in new business, which is really, really good to see. But the interesting thing is, I'm seeing, you know, zero consistency in the market. You know, our we have a couple of deals, Michael and I, where in the one to three million dollar range, probably Michael three in the last week where they were bidding wars that we have a deadline of three to three days to get done and there's yeah. backup offers. I mean, things you would not expect to hear in the middle of a crisis. What I was just kind of, I was saying, it's it's shocking that on these deals, you know, you're you're having bidding wars and you're having people go non-contingent. Uh, that. In order to secure trans, it feels like a couple of years ago where you had to be non-contingent in order to secure a deal. Um, so we're seeing that, especially in the resale market, one to three million range. It's yeah, hey guys, what's that? I was, was going to say I, I'm seeing the same thing. I might I can't tell you. Pre-pandemic and at very normal times, just as you well know, people order title upon contract uh, contract execution, knowing that we have a deal. I would say north of seventy percent of the orders I've gotten this month have been before the contract been signed, knowing that well and good, they're only gonna have about 45 days to close the deal. So they need to get the title part done first. And you know, I've done that to you um, three times, Nick, so thank you. Yeah. yeah, <laughs> no, yeah no, it's it's, which is kind of counterintuitive to what we're going through, you know, like, uh, but on the other end, Michael and I are working on, a, on an $8 million deal now where the original ask was 12. So, you know, the higher the deal, the, the less sense of urgency and the greater the concessions, the, the more normal size deals, which is crazy to say 3 million is normal, but the more, you know, where, where you're, when your demographic is primary occupants, there is a big sense of urgency. Um, I think Sean threw in a message in the, in the chat about sharing an update. Yes, so Sean's willing to talk. He's willing to be our first speaker today. Uh, Sean, I've asked to unmute you if you can accept the request. Sean the she, be careful, Sam. You got a neutral name too. Hi. How you doing, Sean? What's going on? How you been? Good. Uh, interesting. I I got an offer on something today, and they sent it out with their attorney information. And I believe you're their their attorney, but we'll see if we get to an accepted offer, Pierre. Well, Sean, thank you for that. On that note, I'm going to log off now because I've accomplished my um, objective for the day. <laughs> so thanks very much. Um, but talk to us about you know your negotiations because I really want to hear. I'll tell you what I'm seeing, but I'm I'm curious more so you know for your for your perspective right now? So we actually have quite a bit in that sweet spot that you mentioned from one to three. Um, I have a project in Brooklyn, and then I also have some units at 570 Broom, which Pierre has been the attorney for a couple of those deals yeah. as well. Um, two deals negotiated during the pandemic, both closing this week, one closed today, um, and I would say we discounted basically the same that we would have before COVID. Oh, wow. Is, so nothing, in, nothing additional due to COVID? I, I, I would say very little more than what we would have negotiated. Okay. A, a little bit more, but maybe a percentage or two. We were negotiating anyway. And then um, I have a project in Brooklyn, and we have one contract that was just signed at full price for um, 
a unit with a very small terrace on a higher floor, a two bedroom. And we offered concessions, but nothing extraordinary. Yeah. Um, we have, we're very close on another deal that's over 3 million. And we're also offering concessions to get to a deal. And then I just got two more offers today, one at full price with concessions and one a hair off full price. And I think given these offers, we can make deals on these. Mm -hmm. uh, they're, they're nothing like these 20 and 25% offers I was seeing. Um, I've seen some recently, but I also, I saw some during the pandemic, right? A, a few people were throwing those out and they, we, we didn't get it. We didn't go with those at all. Right. We didn't go anywhere with those. Right, right. Um, we cannot accept financing contingencies on our Brooklyn project. Wow. And we are not, uh, it's not within the, uh, scenario of the lender, the underwriter for the okay. construction loan. Yeah. Are you seeing are you seeing buyers is that pushing is that pushing buyers away from the project or you're seeing them I had someone tell me no thank you today their yeah. broker um, so I can't do anything about that right and um, but there are people that are definitely moving forward with non contingent and cash yeah yeah you so wanna, you wanna uh, then have... also just to throw it out there, the rental market for those of us that have a lot of rentals, um, it, you know, it's pretty deadly above 10,000, but we did just sign something this week that was, uh, I normally get 23, five and we got 20. And uh, so, but there's very, very little traffic for those. Yeah. So that's, that's my update. Yeah, no, it's, 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 it's all great points. You know, Michael and I have a deal now in the two and a half million dollar range and our clients going in non-contingent and did so because there's a multiple bid, multiple bid scenario. And what we're requesting is a contingency solely related to COVID issues um, that would essentially render a bank or sorry, lead the banks to file bankruptcy like they did in 2008 when I think it was like half of the five of the top 10 home mortgage lenders declared bankruptcy and the commitment letters went down the tubes. But we're going essentially it's if it's if the world ends like it did in 08 and that's the only thing we're worried about and she's proceeding on a non-contingent basis and she does not have the liquidity to close in cash that she needs to so it's um it's it's an odd odd time michael while you talk about some of the concessions we're seeing on, on our sponsor list because they're all over the place if like you just gave me a list this morning that yeah. we were talking about you know the biggest thing we're seeing is that sponsors want to preserve pricing so as not to set a negative pricing precedent so what we're seeing is is what Sean kind of mentioned, which is that you're seeing concessions behind the scenes, whether it's uh, a year's worth of common charges up front, we're seeing, we're seeing obviously credits towards transfer tax, so which would cover uh, mansion tax. We saw one deal earlier in the pandemic where the sponsor was, was, was seeking to cover our client's mortgage recording tax, which is quite unique. Uh, but in addition to that, we're seeing, you know, uh, throwing in a storage space here and there, gym memberships, some kind of wine tasting club we saw in a deal not too long ago. Um, so kind of unique incentives, but, but I think the overall point is that, you know, sponsors really want to preserve pricing so as not to create a negative precedent on that and, and are giving credits monetary and otherwise behind the scenes within the contracts. Let me, let me ask you all this. It's another important topic too, besides negotiations of our deals. Have you seen, as we talked about this back, uh, probably one of our sessions in May, have you see, seen clients walk away from new development contracts because of what's going on? And have you seen clients become, have you seen any clients successful negotiating for concessions for deals that they were in contract for well before the, the pandemic hit? Because that, that latter point is the one that I'm most interested in hearing about and comparing notes on. So we actually have a ton of, well, not a ton, but we have two comments in the message board that I want to read real quick. Um, Tara asked, have you seen success with buyers leveraging the second deposit in order to negotiate a better price or concessions, i.e. after they have 10% down, then OP declared effective, uh, required to give another 10%? Abigail asked, or commented rather, I just did a rental at 16K and the tenant who just moved out was paying 18.5 million. Um, I had only one person look at that property. So, Otera, your question. Michael, we had one a couple months back where the second deposit is due, and we claimed that we were not going to remit it unless we got a concession, and we were successful in getting it, um, where we held that second deposit as hostage, in a sense, saying, 
you know, Tara, the argument is, you know, if I walk away from the deposit now, the loss, uh, the loss will be less than the loss if I were to close based on the market value reduction. So, you know, it's a, uh, it's a crapshoot of an argument, right? Because part it's basically call my bluff. Yeah, we had one client ask us to do that. You know, I don't know that you'd have much success from a legal standpoint because it would be a default by not remitting this, the deposit. Um, but we did have one success. We had success in that one instance you mentioned. Yeah, we, I don't remember the percentage of the concession. I got I got to look into it, but we yeah. definitely got something um, by holding that second deposit leverage. But I'll be honest with you all. You know, at the moment, I think it's a little premature. You know, Michael and I had a call um, back in May with a client who's in contract for about five million and change. And they're not set to close, I think, to the end of the year, or beginning of next year. Mike, I don't know if you remember the deal I'm talking about. I do. Partner to the firm. And essentially, he's like, I want to go renegotiate. And I'm like, well, what, how can you do so six to eight months prior to closing is the problem. You, you're going to say you suffered financial hardship. All the developers are going to say is wait to the end of the year. We're not closing till then anyway. And see if, see if things improve and we'll worry about it then. I right. go, we have we have very little legal argument at the moment for negotiating for these concessions. It's more sort of a practical argument in that, you know, we've suffered a financial detriment, property values have declined, call my bluff that I'm not going to close, the deposit's not worth me, you know, trying to preserve it. Um, but the, the best argument to be made is when you have a situation where you're, you're, a buyer has a right of rescission on new construction, where, uh, you know, either we've negotiated a drop dead date in the contract, or the first year of condo operations has lapsed, that gives you the most leverage to renegotiate terms because you have a, a clear out of the contract, which is obviously distinguished from what you were just mentioning. Have you all seen any projects go belly up yet or be forced to offer rights of rescission due to defaults in the construction loan or failure to meet deadlines? One yeah. One by Greenwich, Terry. Yeah, we just had four deals. Hit four of those. Yet. Four. Yeah. Four this month. Yeah, they were jumping for joy when they got and every there. single buyer rescinded who had the right to rescind. Yep. Yeah. Anybody else? Because that's the only one I've seen. And they were troubled before COVID. They defaulted on their construction loan. It was well publicized in the papers. Um, they renegotiated the loan with thing with a new lender, and they just didn't meet their deadlines. And now everybody's out. But I have not seen any other projects besides 125 Greenwich. That, that have had that happen. Um, if you do come across them, please let me know. So I'm trying to keep tabs on that too, but. The other one I saw Pierre, which is wait, pre-pandemic was 60 Imlay in Brooklyn. Okay. Uh, which they were also defaulting on their construction loans. And on that one, the, their first year of anticipated operations had lapsed. They were trying to make a novel argument to keep us in the deal, but we engaged along with us outside counsel to get them out. Yeah. So that was another project that uh, people had a right of rescission on. Yeah, I remember that was a sizable deal too. So like three million in the three million. That was three plus. It was one of the most expensive units in the project, like a penthouse unit. It was, right. I believe it's in Red Hook. So it was a very expensive unit for that project yeah. that we were able to get our client out. Um, one other thing I want to really talk to you guys about, which I'm really curious to hear and hear your perspective, especially that you, you're more in, you know, constant communication with developers than I am. What all the shadow inventory that's out there? You know, it's it's rather troubling. You know, we're we represent um, Kale Goodman over at Market Proof. And Kale sent me some stats that MarketProof has talking about shadow inventory, came up with um, a way to track it through attorney general filings that 20,000 condo units um, have come in the market since 2018. More than 60% remain unsold. But even with that, only 10% are usually available um, for or listed for sale online and the rest is shadow inventory. So you have several projects where, you know, 50 to 90% of the project shadow inventory that's not even out there available for sale. What, what's going to happen to all these units? Like at what point do developers have to cut pricing, unload units? How long can they hold on to these units indefinitely for to give the false perception of the market to the market that there's not much inventory available, thus negotiability is low. Like I, I, I want to, you know, I'm really curious to see how this plays out. Hi guys. How you doing? Hey, good. 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 Nice good to, to see you from. all. Likewise. How you Hold been? On, let me, good. Thank you. There. Oh, no, it's a bad. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, at, I'm at 100 Barclay right now. Oh, cool. Which is offering 5% to buy side agents, if anybody's interested. <laughs> <laughs> There's, that's an uh, interesting concession. 
Yeah, exactly. So we're, we're doing a lot of concession packages. Um, we don't have a ton left. You know, we're sort of in a good spot. So I think it's pretty, um, you know, patient capital. But it's what we're seeing is a lot of developers, like I'm, you know, consulting on the Hayworth, Upper East Side, um, working with a lot of buyers on projects. I put a, a four bedroom into contract at Beckford Tower. And that's one actually, I, my buyer threatened to walk away from a 10% deposit, which was $700,000 in order to get, to give the second portion of the deposit. And they called our bluff and they said, we're not gonna give you anything. We said, give us something that doesn't show up as recorded price, you know, throw us a carrot, um, a couple of years, common charges, whatever. And they said, no, we're not giving you anything. We'll take your deposit or see you later. So that was interesting. Um, you know, $7 million apartment. But what I'm seeing right now is a lot of developers just playing the wait and see game. Yep. So the question is, as the economy, you know, further develops, I'll be curious to see in a few months from now if that position changes or they get more pressure from their lenders or their partners um, or the banks. And I think there's a lot of capital that's coming due or, you know, payments coming due in the near future. So, but what, like, what are you guys hearing from, what are the developers saying to you in regards to the pipeline and inventory? They, they they don't tell us much on that topic. Uh, Michael, yeah. tell me if you have a different opinion. No, we, they, we get no, it, we, we ask about number of units in contract, you know, and, things yeah. like that. They always say that's proprietary information. We're not going to give that to you. Yeah. They always try, but we never it's heard. It's perplexing to me because the AG has such, you know, uh, extensive amount of regulations and requirements for new development. I right. don't know how the proper disclosure, because if I'm buying in a building, obviously part of the ascertaining the health and viability of the project is knowing what sales are and not, you know, they always tell us, sorry, we don't disclose that information. And it also matters in terms of financing, right? You need a, you need a exactly. number of units under contract to finance on new construction projects. And if you're non-contingent, that could put you in a bad spot. Yeah. Which is what we always ask and we, they don't tell us anyway. The other thing is that if, if it's a brand new to market project, if it's not, we need to know that it's 15% so that they can declare the offering plan effective. And right. I don't want to recommend to a buyer, oh, this is a great property. If you know, even if you can negotiate a good price, if you don't know that they're going to be able to move forward right. with the project and sales. So it's, um, I don't know, it's, it's an interesting time, but I have a report in front of me that, which is a inside scoop. And I think the, the pipeline they're saying for 2021, there's another 1900 units already under construction. So there's a whole bunch that hasn't filed with AG. There's, you know, there's a lot of inventory that needs to be absorbed. I think it's like seven to nine years of inventory or something. That, absorption rate, which, yeah, is astronomical, so, which is astronomical. It's normally, it's normally like two to three years, right? Give or take, it depends on the sub market and the price, yes. but it's particularly on the luxury market on the super high end. It's, you know, it's, it's a lot of inventory to absorb. So I think a lot of sponsors will pivot to rentals. Um, yeah. You know, a lot like we, we're offering a rent to own program. So they're getting creative with, with that stuff that we saw like 2009, 2010, mm -hmm. you know? Right. Yeah. I, um, US News, the world report called me last month. I did an interview with them in terms of how developers will adjust to these times. And I said the exact same thing, rent to own will become a concept that we are going to start negotiating again which we haven't seen in close to a dozen years. Um, if, you, if you all have negotiated rent to own or have not, um, one of the key factors to it is determining the rent from now and whether a portion of that rent is applied to credit towards the purchase price should you exercise the option. So you agree on a price today of say 5 million and you go ahead and you rent the unit for uh, whatever it be, 15,000 a month or 20,000 a month for the next year, if you exercise your option, a, pro, a portion of that rent, if not the whole rent, should be applied as a credit um, towards a price is one of the more popular mechanisms. It doesn't have to be that way, but that's probably, that's the incentive to somebody to say, I'll do a rent to own, that they secure a price that they like with a vested financial interest in a, in a concession based off of the rent they pay and the option to say, okay, well, if the world gets better and I make more money or whatever variable they may have for the, themselves, they can exercise that option next year. So yeah, Tara, I think you're going to see a lot more of that because developers are going to get, they're going to get creative in markets like this. They have to, and they have to be nimble. One question on that note, Pierre, when it comes to concessions, 
for example, there's the there's the classic, you know, um, transfer taxes, storage, whatever, wine cellar, the whole, you know, all that common charges. When you start to negotiate a credit at closing or something that's really like more of a cash value, or and I guess the other part of that question is as all the concessions as a whole, as an attorney, at what percentage of the price do you flag it or what are the rules? I've always kind of wanted to understand that the yeah. thresholds that you flag or don't flag. Yeah, you know, it's funny. I talked, I talked about this in one session um, yeah. where I talked about it mainly from an ethical perspective. So my, the thing I personally hate is that these prices are recorded prices and the developers doing everything humanly possible to maintain the recorded prices as high as they can, they can be. However, it's deceptive to the marketplace because the concessions are extensive and the market can't tell what kind of concessions you got. Theoretically, I can sell you a $20 million apartment and give you a $10 million you know, concession and a rider and it would be completely defrauding the marketplace. Where, at what percentage point is it considered fraud versus just the natural negotiation of a deal given the market and providing what would be reasonable concessions? It's all subjective. I, we don't have parameters for this. Like, I personally, like, I, I, I wish that concessions, to be quite frank, were recorded. I think that the market should should be aware of the truth. I, I'm seeing co-op boards start to abuse this uh, abuse this as well for their own self-serving benefit. Um, yeah. So to answer your question, I haven't seen anything so egregious. You know, like we'll negotiate the price will be reduced three, you know, to ten percent, and then there'll be concessions aggregating another three percent. So the price reductions reflected, obviously, and then the concessions are closing costs, mansion tax, you know, maybe a decoration credit. But I've, I haven't seen anything where it's like another 10% hidden in a rider that nobody knows about. Right, Michael? Like, it's been, we haven't come across anything egregious, I'd say. I agree. What you're mostly seeing is coverage of mansion tax, contribution to a working capital fund contribution, or a coverage of that. You're seeing, you know, coverage of sponsors' attorneys' fees, uh, you know, but you're not seeing anything. I haven't seen any kind of sort of 10% kind of concession in a rider before. Right. There's been no like, you know, $10 million deal and we have a $2 million decoration credit in the rider. Um, but but I, 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 I'm I scared that we will see that in, in the next year. I think we will. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's terrible. I, I really do. Um, I don't, I, I don't know the right answer to that. You know, I don't know if I'm surprised the attorney general hasn't intervened. And in, as I say, the AG should come out on this. They really should. I, I'm yeah, not I've always wondered, and everybody has a different answer. Like every attorney you talk to, whether it's a sponsor's attorney or a buyer's attorney, says, "Oh, if it's if the, you know, a credit, um, cash credit at closing, let's say it's a two hundred thousand dollar credit, somebody's going to freak out over that and say, no, 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 we can't possibly do that.' So it's I've always just been curious, but yeah, interesting. Yeah, yeah. The the lenders. So let me tell you real quick, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, regs. If you're getting financing they cap the credit at 6%. So not price reduction. You can negotiate whatever price reduction you want, as long as the price is the price. In terms of concessions in a rider, like closing cost pickups, um, decoration credits, supers unit, that can't aggregate more than 6% of the price. So that's a federal gui lending guideline. But in a cash deal, theoretically, you can do whatever the hell you want, which is troubling because a, lot, a large portion of our sponsor purchases are cash deals. And I think that that's going to be something that's abused heavily. Um, and I, and I, I hope the AG intervenes because I think it's not fair for the, the consumer. Oh, I guess I've been saying a lot of stuff here. So some of it, Pierre, I think you just said, but if I were attorney repping a new deaf buyer, I would tell the sponsor attorney that your clients will not sign without disclosure of number of signed contracts. I just, I would say, no, we're not going to sign. It doesn't mean that they won't sign, but I don't see how that is not the, your right to know when you're doing your due diligence. I think, I think it should be an amendment to the offering plan that's filed on a monthly basis, personally. I, again, this is another point that I'm, the, I'm surprised the AG is not adapted to in, in the last decade. Um, but I mean, I'll tell you. I'll tell yeah, you if we've, if it, we've gone so far as to get a contract out and negotiate with someone, at that point, a buyer has a right to get an idea. I I wholeheartedly agree. The problem is, Sean, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna jeopardize a deal over that question without the client's consent. So I'm not gonna say in my negotiations. Tell me this, or we're walking. 
because some clients are going to say, I want the property regardless. It's a strong developer. I'm willing, mo most, believe it or not, and I don't agree with this, most are willing to live without that information. Um, and we push back as much as we can, but you know, I've not had a client say, I'm not signing unless I find this out. And I, and I found that mostly in the, in, the, in the larger sponsor attorney firms, the Kramer 11s, the Holland and Knights. On smaller projects, you get more information generally. Like we're doing small, some small projects in Brooklyn where we get all that color, but I've seen it mostly in the context of larger firms that's, that are not divulging it. Sean, let me send you a link. Um, Market Proof came up. The, re, the, the way we've been hedging our bets against this is that Market Proof is able to come up with a sub website called Buyers List, where it gives you the shadow inventory um, for all these projects and helps us get this information without having to, you know, jeopardize a deal. So you actually have it prior to, sorry, um, you have this information now when you start your negotiations, which is the key, I think, uh, component to have because obviously it helps you tailor and structure negotiations in advance having this information as opposed to waiting until it gets to my desk. So it was you. interesting what you said because I typed in that if there is a lender, I wrote, I don't believe these large concessions are viable. And then after I wrote that, you said that you that Fannie Mae, they cannot accept concessions over 6%. Yeah, 6% um, federal guideline. That, that means any kinds of concessions? That means storage? Yeah, uh, I, I, I got to look exactly how they interpret it, but I, I'm pretty sure it's a combination of, uh, of everything. Maybe that storage, means. if they throw in storage as part of the deal, maybe that's not included. Uh, I'd, I'd have to double check. We oh. haven't had it come up yet where it's been questioned, but that's a good point. Because I would say it's very typical, it's, and you're going to see, if not already, concessions of between 6 to 10%. Well, you know, with its concessions, part of that's price reductions, I'm assuming, and part of that's closing costs, part of that's- Not always. Okay. I don't think things like storage units would be factored in. I think it's mainly closing costs picking up of closing cost and credits towards the price. So if you if you buy for 5 million and then there's a 200 grand closing credit that's applied and the price is really 4.8, that will be taken into consideration along with the closing cost that they pick up. One of the other sessions I'm doing is apparently I'm addicted to looking at myself on a camera. Um, doing my weekly webcast next week. Um, I do one called Real Estate Talks with Pierre DeBoss. Um, you, we do it through our, our school, the New York uh, Real Estate Center, which you guys are familiar with after the last number of months. Um, so I do, I'm doing, I usually do it once a week. August, I'm only going to do the first two weeks, I believe. So we've been doing that webcast. Um, we started one called Legal Hotline, which Michael does along with our partner, uh, Michael Romer, talking about legal issues in the market on a weekly basis. Um, we do one called the Pro Shop, which brings in various real estate professionals from every different from different, you know, different professions to talk about, you know, their perspective on what's going on in the market and issues they're seeing. And we do one more, Sam, right? Why am I drawing a blank? Uh, or is that everything? The coaching. That's everything that, oh, in real estate coaching, where we're doing one where um, we're having various managers and professionals um, give coaching tips for how to navigate markets like this and, you know, just just comparing notes for the profession. But so those are all really cool 30 minute segments we're doing for the whole market. So um, keep your eyes and ears open for those if you're interested um, uh, for NIRAC sessions. And I think this is our last one till after Labor Day, if I recall correctly. Correct me if I'm wrong. But um, if, um, if I'm right, obviously either way, please, you guys have any questions on anything, email Michael or I, we're here, we're around. Um, again, I, I'm, we're seeing things really busy last two weeks, which is really, really positive sign. Um, and, I'm, and, and I'm happy to see, and hopefully we continue that trajectory. And thanks, everybody. Anna, thanks for setting it up and hope everybody's well. Thanks, everyone. Good to see everyone. Thank you.